Hi guys, uh, let's do a video on membrane structure and function. Now, really before I get going here, there's a comment to make, and I've said this before, and I'll say it again. Uh, the first test, the first of three exams, the first test sort of lays out everything that we're going to cover in a semester. Okay. The second test goes into more detail on things we've already done. So a lot of this is going to be like very similar to things you've seen in the past. I'm like, oh, that makes perfect sense. I remember talking about this before. In fact, that's the same slide. And then we're going to go into more detail on those concepts. All right. So the idea is you're familiar with it at this stage, and now it's time to expand your knowledge base on it. So with that in mind, let's roll right on through. Now, we see here a set of beautiful images. This is some nice, what appears to be plant cells. I'd say that because they're nice and square. Uh, this is probably from like a tuber or something, like a um, maybe an onion. This is probably an onion skin. Uh, these are showing cell membranes, really beautiful phospholipid bilayers, just really neat stuff. And that gives you an idea of where we're going when we say membrane transport. Now, I have to start on an interesting story, because when I start reading about membrane transport, really the first thing that pops up to me is the concept of capsaicin and spicy foods. For those of you that are unaware, capsaicin uh, is a uh, it's a protein, binds to a protein, what's capsaicin made of? It, it's a hydrocarbon all the same, it's a big organic molecule, and, and what capsaicin does is it's a triggering molecule, it can bind to your cell membranes and basically give them a pain signal. Now, capsaicin is what gives spicy food its spiciness, okay? Um, when you taste food and it tastes spicy, spice is not a flavor that you're capable of interpreting. Spice is pain, okay? It's actually triggering pain receptors. And sometimes we can really see this, okay? Uh, this is my buddy Mark. This is about seven years ago. And we went to a uh, burger place in Atlanta, Georgia, after we, like a whole group of folks, went to Six Flags. And Mark had this brilliant idea to get, like, this super spicy hamburger that they had there. I forget the name of the place. Uh, so he gets this burger, and he starts eating it. And, man, his eyes were pouring. Like, he was turning red. Like, you could see him. Like, he couldn't hardly, his whole nasal cavity was on fire. He was in bad shape. And that's because he was having a real, we call it a sympathetic nervous system response, a fight or flight response, because of all of the pain his system was sensing in the form of spicy food, but pain all the same, he was hurting. And uh, that, that's really fascinating. Just a chemical, it's just a chemical, there's no damage to him, uh, just a chemical saying to his um, pain receptors in his oral cavity, hey, we're hurting really bad, causes this whole body-wide effect, okay, sweating all over, almost shaking from it. It's amazing. Uh, and that brings up a neat little comment as well, and that is milk versus water. Okay, uh, milk and water. Water is a polar covalently bonded molecule, and capsaicin is nonpolar. So if you are eating something very spicy and you're drinking water to try to get rid of the spice, it does nothing, and you know this. What you're supposed to drink is milk, all right? When you're eating something very, very spicy, you're supposed to drink milk because the milk washes away the capsaicin, which in turn um, no longer causes you pain, I guess. So the idea is that the milk contains a lot of fat, and fats are nonpolar covalently bound. So when you drink the milk, the milk fat binds to the capsaicin, and it washes away and gets off your receptors so you no longer feel the pain stimulus, the spiciness from that capsaicin seems like a, it was a mess, but I hope you get my point. This is really neat. Uh, the, a, a simple molecule, okay, a simple molecule can bind to your receptors of your cells and trigger whole body-wide effects. That's pretty wild. All right, plasma membranes. The first thing I need to get across to you, and I'm going to, like, repeat myself a million times in this lecture, but the first thing I really need to, need to get across to you is the concept of the fluid mosaic model of cell membrane structure, Okay. Uh, when we say that your cell membranes are a fluid mosaic, like you know that your cell membranes contain a bunch of phospholipids, you know that those phospholipids have a hydrophobic region and a hydrophilic region, the hydro, well, I said that backwards, but you get my point, 
The hydrophilic region are the heads here and there, and then the hydrophobic region is the tail portion here. So we know about these phospholipids in a bilayer. You know at this stage that your cell membranes has more than just phospholipids, that there are proteins and all sorts of things associated with cell membranes. When we say that your cell membranes are a fluid mosaic, what we're saying is that all this stuff isn't anchored tightly in place. It isn't just a concrete, unchanging structure. What this is actually is very flowy, okay? It's very, very much flowy. The, the parts and pieces here in the membrane, they can jostle around one another and move. They're constantly flowing. In fact, uh, the cholesterol molecules that you can see here that are associated with cell membrane, they help to keep it moving all the time. They keep the membrane very much in motion, always, which is very important to the way the membrane works. The membrane gets too solid, it doesn't function correctly. So it's a really a neat set of structures is this fluid mosaic model demonstrating how everything kind of moves around. I feel like I've got some images of this later. We'll get to that in a bit. Now, the membrane itself, as I said, is about 98% lipids by number, by count. Uh, so the vast majority of the membrane, when you see it, is lipid. Most of this will be what we call unsaturated phospholipids. These are the regular old phospholipids that are all over the place. Uh, this is the ones that you think about as forming the phospholipid bilayer. But there can be some what they call saturated phospholipids. And uh, this will be the same phospholipid, but they're built a little different and they're affixed to one another like a raft. So this whole solid unit kind of flows around in the cell membrane. So you've got like a spot, like right there, and it's a solid mass of phospholipids. So instead of being individuals, they are connected to one another. And they kind of flow around as a unit called a lipid raft. And I'll mention those again in just a second. Uh, there are cholesterol molecules here and there and there and there. They do help keep the membrane very fluid. And then, of course, there are glycoproteins and glycolipids. Anything glyco means sugar. Uh, we're dealing with these sugars on the outer surface of this cell membrane. And these sugars together, you can hear my kids having a great time in there. They're having a great time. Uh, these sugars all together uh, give us what we call the cell's glycocalyx. Now, a glycocalyx literally means a sugar coat, okay? And this sugar coating on the outer surface of your cells uh, will oftentimes play a role in what we refer to as self, non-self recognition. So the ability of, for instance, your white blood cells that give you immunity. One second. Back again. All right. The glycocalyx, glycocalyx, glycocalyx. Uh, this sugar coating on the outer surface of your cells lends to what we call self, non-self recognition. And what this is really getting at is uh, the ability of your white blood cells, like uh, various lymphocytes or T cells, to recognize your cells versus foreign cells. Imagine if you get, um, geez, I don't know, stuck with something. Uh, who can say? You walk, you're walking around outside, you step on a stick, and it sticks through your foot. And that gets bacteria into your bloodstream. Oh, that'd be real bad. Uh, that could lead to you going septic, which is devastating. Okay, So you don't want that to happen. What will take place is the outer surface markers of that bacteria are very much different from your outer surface markers, your glycocalyx. So your white blood cells can kind of cruise around through your red blood cell, or I'm sorry, through your blood or into your lymph nodes, and they can feel the surfaces of all the cells they come into contact with. And any that don't match your glycocalyx, they destroy. Okay, The glycocalyx lends to self, non-self recognition. The ability of your immune cells to recognize your cells versus cells that are not yours so that you can uh, use your immune system to defend you versus pathogens. So these sugars, these sugars are very, very important. Uh, let's see. So in the membrane, there are two types of proteins that are worthy of our consideration. Now, all the proteins together make up a huge amount of the mass of your... Hang on. Change of scenery. Uh, sometimes, you know, it's, it's just as hard teaching from home as it is to learn from home. And we're all in this together. So I'm trying to provide you with the best I can give. All right. So that should have ended up the glycocalyx. Let's go to here. 
uh, types of proteins, be they integral or peripheral. So integral proteins and peripheral proteins, they actually make up about half of the membrane by weight. So they aren't, there aren't that many of them, but they're massive and very heavy and weighty. So scientific term, weighty. Um, they make up a lot of the membrane by weight, and there are two types. There are peripheral proteins, uh, and there are integral proteins. Integral proteins and peripheral proteins. Now, the integral proteins are those which span the entire length of the membrane. So they go from the outside of the cell to the inside of the cell. They go all the way through the center, like, like so, right? All the way through. Uh, peripheral proteins are typically like associated with either the outside of the membrane or the inside of the membrane. They aren't through the middle. They'll be like connected to part of the membrane, either on the outside or the inside, one or the other. Well, let's go through and look at some of the major players in terms of these proteins. First, a look at the integral proteins. Now, there's a whole host of different types of these, all right? There's a bunch. And, and this is just an umbrella set of a few of those, but you'll get my point. All right, receptors. Your receptors for things like hormones, for example, those are integral proteins. The important stuff. Those are integral proteins. And uh, so what will happen is a chemical messenger, like a hormone, for example, can be cruising through the blood, come into contact with the outer surface of this cell, bind to the appropriate receptor on that cell, and then trigger it to do some sort of job, as you will see a little bit later on. There could be enzymes, which would be involved in building or breaking things up associated with the cell membrane. There are some ion channels, which are always open and just let things through at random. Um, a really good example of this might be something like the aquaporins in your blood cells. So they constantly let a free flow of materials through them to keep the blood cell uh, osmotically balanced with its external environment. All right, so always open. There are also gated ion channels. And gated ion channels are some of the most important in living things, okay? Uh, let's just use you as an example. When you hear me, what I'm doing is I'm vibrating air, which in turn is leading to your speakers vibrating air around you, and those vibrations pass into your ear, shake your eardrum, shake your ear bones, the malleus, incus, and stapes, and then eventually get into your inner ear to a structure called your cochlea, and they shake part of the cochlea. And then when that part shakes, it triggers gated ion channels to open, and that's what leads to a stimulation arriving at your brain that you interpret as hearing. In fact, the nerves that convey the message from your cochlea to your brain are using gated ion channels to convey that message down the length of that nerve. In fact, the neurons in your brain which allow you to understand and interpret the words I'm saying are using gated ion channels to open and close as a signaling device. What I'm trying to say is gated ion channels are really important. Okay. Uh, next we have cellular identity markers. This would be um, a, a lot like parts of that glycocalyx that we were talking about previously. They bear a sugar molecule on their outer surface. And the way you gotta think about this is that sugar molecule or those sugar molecules on your outer surface, they're like a uh, cellular barcoding mechanism, okay? They allow, it, it's like stuff in a grocery store. You, you run it across the scanner and it picks up the barcode and then the store knows what's moving. Your cells have a cellular identity mar uh, marking system referred to as a glycocalyx that allows you to do self versus non-self recognition. It allows other cells of your body to interpret if this is one of yours or somebody else's. Like blood type is a good example of this. Your blood type is determined by cellular identity markers like this bearing sugars. Like if you're type A blood, that means you have A markers. Anyway, uh, and then last but not least, there are CAMs or cellular adhesion molecules. Cellular adhesion molecules. Uh, so CAMs or cellular adhesion molecules, these are basically like the hands and feet of cells in your body that move around, okay, of, or of anything that moves around for that matter. Uh, cellular adhesion molecules allow your white blood cells to attach to vessels and move through them uh, by what's referred to as diapetesis. They're allowed to kind of move through the walls of your blood vessels and into your surrounding tissues so that they can hunt down and kill potential pathogens. So those are cellular adhesion molecules. They're like the little hands to allow stuff to move around inside the cell, or inside the body for that matter. Uh, receptors and cell signaling. Okay, so this is kind of a, 
I tried to simplify a complex process, and by accident, I made it even more complicated. So I'm going to lay this on you in the complicated way that is actually easier. Is that English? I don't know. In your body, you have hormones that allow you to communicate from one part of your body to the next. Like your brain can release a hormone called growth hormone and stimulate your bones to lengthen when you're going through puberty. Okay, you know this. Uh, you know that your pancreas releases a hormone called insulin that lowers your blood sugar levels. Okay, this is very simple. There are signaling molecules, like hormones, uh, that serve as chemical messengers and allow one part of a body or what have you communicate with another. What will happen is these uh, hormones or signaling molecules flow through the bloodstream, eventually getting to cells which have the appropriate receptor for that hormone or signaling molecule. Okay? And, and this is very important. Not all cells have the same receptors. Uh, for example, during for example, during pregnancy, hang on. I mean not drop things. For example, during pregnancy, uh, when the uh, baby is going to be arriving relatively soon, uh, the brain will release a hormone called oxytocin, and, uh, and, and this actually causes uterine contractions. It doesn't cause bicep contractions, it causes uterine contractions, because you want the uterus to contract to push that kid out. Uh, so the hormone causes this. It doesn't cause, for our purposes, anything anywhere else, because only the uterus has the right receptors. So these are referred to as being target cells. They have the right receptors. Uh, yeah, okay. So a hormone or a signaling molecule flows through the blood, comes into contact with a cell with its appropriate receptor type, and can signal that cell to do all kinds of stuff, folks. It can signal that cell to grow. It can signal that cell to die. It can signal that cell to make something for the body. It can signal that cell to break something down for the body. I mean, you name it, man. You name it. It could lead to all sorts of things. I, I call this a cascade of events might occur. Uh, so short term, easy way to say this. There are signaling molecules, which are often coined as hormones. These will flow through the bloodstream, connect to the outer surface proteins of the cell, and can signal that cell to do a job, okay, to do something. That is classic classic membrane structure and function. Perfect. All right, so uh, here is your membrane. This is your fluid mosaic. On the inside, we have the cell. On the outside, we have connective tissues, um, typically referred to as an extra extracellular matrix. This is stuff on the outside of your cells, for example, in your connective tissues. Uh, our membrane itself has these proteins. It's got sugars on the outside for identification. It's got a uh, phospholipid bilayer, which is very much fluid mosaic. It's got cholesterols to keep that membrane fluid. This is what we're dealing with. So, what gets through? And the answer is more than you'd probably think, but not much. Okay. Uh, think about what has to happen or what you have to have in your cells on a moment-to-moment -moment basis for you to survive. Water easily gets through the membrane. Nutrient molecules pass through with relative ease. Uh, waste molecules as a breakdown product pass through with relative ease. Gases are very small, so they pass through with relative ease. Certain drugs pass through with relative ease. The idea is really small molecules tend to get through. Uh, bigger molecules have trouble, okay? Um, Polar molecules tend not to get through. Nonpolar molecules tend not to struggle as much. They get through with more ease. Uh, so there's a, there's a lot happening here. We're going to go into the detail and talk about it in just a second. But our key concepts of the cell membrane that you need to be aware of is the cell membrane is going to be selectively permeable. That means some things pass, other things don't. It can pick what goes through and what doesn't. Your cell membranes are a fluid mosaic. All this stuff is freely flowing around and moving inside of there. And three, proteins, the proteins of the membrane drive the general function of the cell, okay? Uh, what allows the cell to respond to hormone molecules? The proteins do, okay? Uh, this is very important, very important. What, what allows my, my bicep to respond to the neurotransmitters sent from my brain to tell my bicep to contract? 
proteins. There are proteins in there that receive the neurotransmitters from the brain and say contract bicep and my bicep contracts. The proteins drive the function. Now, let's go in a little bit and let's talk about the cytoskeleton. Your cells have a skeleton not unlike your skeleton. And you should be familiar with this at this stage. I feel like we've already talked about it. Uh, some of this will be made out of microfilaments. Microfilaments are uh, made of little subunits called actin subunits. And microfilaments tend to be involved in cellular motility. In lab, you should have seen, or was it in lecture? Either way, you've seen a video of a, um, oh shoot, they move with pseudopods. An amoeba, you've seen the video of an amoeba kind of reaching around with its cell and engulfing something. That movement is driven by microfilaments, actin molecules. So these assist in movement, cellular movement. Uh, there are intermediate filaments which have very high tensile strength. In your cells, they tend to be associated with structures called desmosomes. You'll see this in a second. But these are very strong, they're like rope. Okay, so you can pull against them and they get tight and go no further. They make the cell very tension resilient, uh, but they are non compressive. Much like a rope, if I push against it, you know, I get nothing. So imagine my mask here. I can pull it, and it becomes tight and goes no further, but it's, <laughs> I can't compress it. All right, and then, of course, there are microtubules. And microtubules are, like, super cool from my perspective. They're far larger, and they have compressive strength. So microtubules are like this uh, radius here. You, you can't compress them. They're hard. They're like tent poles. They keep the cell open when the cell is trying to collapse. And microtubules tend to be associated with motor proteins. Uh, so microtubules form up like a railway system for your cells. When stuff needs to move around inside the cell, it will attach to microtubule networks to be carried from place to place. All right, so the microtubules are like a subway in the cell, allowing materials to move from one place to the next. All right, uh, what, 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 are we, what are we on here? Membrane transport. Okay, membranes are selectively permeable. The hydrophobic core does indeed impede the movement of ions and polar molecules. In other words, hydrophobic molecules, um, polar, or no, no, let me try again. Hydrophobic molecules, like nonpolar molecules, tend to be able to get through easily, whereas polar molecules tend to struggle. Okay, tend to struggle. Big things like glucose do not pass readily. They have to have helper proteins to help get them across because glucose is so big. Uh, proteins play a key role in regulating all of this, like the aquaporins in your red blood cells that allow for the exchange of ions internally and water molecules to help maintain osmotic balance. What else do we want to see? Oh, shoot. I got a cigarette and a glass of liquor up here, so I guess we better talk about it. <sighs> Many years ago, as a younger man, my first alcohol experience Okay. Uh, I remember going to a concert with some friends of mine, and they asked me to drive. I was a, a younger guy. I was probably 18 or 19. Don't quote me. Um, and I'm driving these guys to this concert. I'm very excited. And lo and behold, they were all drinking in the car behind me in the back seat while I was driving, and a buddy up in the front was smoking. Okay. This was an interesting experience for me, who was very straight-laced at the time. I know you'd never guess. When we got to the concert, they were like, you got to take a drink out of this bottle. No, 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 no. There's no need in it. It's not a big deal. No, no you, need to, you need to do this. You got to do this. So peer pressure. I took that bottle, and I turned it up and took a big gulp of whatever it was, and it was terrifying. It was very disgusting from my perspective. Uh, things have changed. I have kids now. But uh, at the time, it was pretty gross. But I remember... Within a minute, 30 seconds, I, I felt thoroughly intoxicated. In hindsight, I was like, what is going on? This is different. Things have changed from the way that they were before. And I remember thinking that it was completely psychosomatic, all right? It was all in my head. Like, there's no way that this could, inf like, augment my physiology within 30 seconds to a minute. Like, you take four steps and all of a sudden I feel intoxicated? No way. Yes way, right? Yes way. Uh, it turns out that alcohol uh, is a rare substance, uh, being that it is quite hydrophobic. It actually is capable of passing the walls of the stomach 
and entering the bloodstream within moments of drinking it. All right, no other uh, compound I'm aware of actually can do this, but alcohol does. You drink alcohol, it'll cross the walls of the stomach and enter the bloodstream directly. Now, from the stomach, it's a very short trip to the brain via the bloodstream. Uh, less than a minute, without any question. Without any question. It depends on the path it all takes and how it all works, but uh, far less than a minute. Okay? It's going to be in your brain, from the glass to your brain, within minutes. Easily within minutes. And someone at, in my situation who had never had alcohol in their life, uh, very quickly indeed. All right? Because what's fascinating about alcohol is not only does it pass the walls of the stomach readily, but it's a very rare molecule that's also capable of passing what's referred to as your blood-brain barrier. So it gets into your brain very fast as well. Um, and that, folks, explains why we have the relationship with alcohol that we have. We've been brewing alcohol for, what, 6,000 years or so? There may have been a discovery recently where they found it even older. But we've been brewing a long time because alcohol passes the walls of the stomach and is capable of passing the blood-brain barrier and causing an augmentation to your physiology fast. And that's why we like it so much. And it's the same story with tobacco. Why don't we smoke rose petals or something ridiculous like that? Because tobacco contains nicotine, and nicotine is absorbed through the walls of your alveoli and your lungs when you smoke it, where it goes directly straight to the brain and can augment the brain's physiology just like that, almost instantaneously after taking a hit of the cigarette. I mean, I've seen people like really freaking out, nervous, man, it's, oh man, I'm gonna do a cigarette. And they get the cigarette and they <sighs> and it's this instantaneously better. And I remember judging people and thinking, well, oh, it's all in their head, this is bullcrap. No, no, it's not. It's a physiological response. The nicotine augments the brain's chemistry almost instantaneously. Membrane transport is pretty neat. All right, <clears throat> now that I've spent entirely too long talking about this, let's talk about the two main ways that items cross biological membranes. These are passive transport mechanisms and active transport mechanisms. And what you need to know immediately when I say that is that Passive transport does not require energy input from the body, whereas active transport mechanisms require energy. They, they need ATP to work. Passive mechanisms happen naturally. Active mechanisms are requiring ATP. They take work from the body in order to make them happen. So what are we dealing with? Uh, passive mechanisms include diffusion, osmosis, and facilitated transport, whereas active transport um, is involving what's commonly called primary active transit and then secondary transit or vesicular bulk transport. All right, passive transport mechanisms. Uh, some terms that you heard me discuss in lab are solution, solvent, and solute. A solution is a combination of a solvent and a solute. Um, the classic example is Kool-Aid. This is one I always use because people always understand it. Uh, you take water, that is a solvent, and you pour Kool-Aid into it, that is a solute, and it will diffuse through the entirety of whatever container you pour it into. You can go into your kitchen right now, get you some water, put it on the table, open a thing of Kool-Aid, pour it in there, walk away, come back tomorrow, and it looks like you've stirred it, but you didn't. Because the molecules in there are all jostling around against one another, and that is leading to the mixing of that solute and solvent to make this solution. That's good old-fashioned diffusion, folks. Diffusion is the movement of molecules from a high concentration to a low concentration. It's very simple. Doesn't require energy. Happens naturally. Um, your lungs do this. This is how you convey oxygen and carbon dioxide in your lungs. When I breathe in, there's a lot of oxygen in the air that I breathe in. And that oxygen diffuses through the alveoli of my lungs and gets into my bloodstream. Then the blood flowing through the lungs is carrying a lot of carbon dioxide as a cellular waste product. That carbon dioxide diffuses into the air of the lungs. And then when I exhale, <sighs> that is mostly carbon dioxide by comparison. 
So um, diffusion governs your ability to absorb oxygen from the atmosphere and to release carbon dioxide. And if you don't do this constantly, you won't live very long. So this is very important. Very, very important. Net movement from high concentration to low concentration. Uh, okay, so these are things that influence this. Temperature pressure of certain electrical currents, molecular size, all of these influence diffusion. So at a hotter temperature, if you make Kool-Aid with hot water, it goes faster because diffusion takes place very much faster uh, when temperatures are raised. Pressure, if uh, things are under pressure, they can certainly diffuse faster. Uh, electrical currents, we can use electrical current to spread things through chemicals uh, so we can influence diffusion. But more importantly than a lot of the rest is molecular size. So big molecules, big molecules tend to diffuse very slow. Small molecules, tend to diffuse very fast. They move much more quickly. Um, and that's just a simple thing. And one more that kind of influences this is concentration. Your higher concentrations tend to move faster than lower concentrations. Now, I want to point out something that's not on your test, but I find it to be pretty fascinating. And that is the concept of Brownian motion. You can go ahead and look that up if you want. Pause video, give it a search. Brownian motion. Uh, in essence, what you can do is you can get a substance called matte black it's basically a bunch of tiny carbon molecules and you can put them on a microscope slide in water and zoom way on in and you can see the carbon molecules vibrating. See them vibrating? They just vibrate, man. Just vibrate. And they slowly, they jostle around each other. You can take the slide and chill it and they will move slower. And then you can take the slide and hold a lighter next to it and heat it up and they'll move faster. Uh, what this is showing you is that water molecules, as an example, are constantly in motion. They are constantly in motion. And this is one of the things that drives diffusion, is that all liquids, all gases, they are constantly in flux. And this drives diffusion. Passive transport. Uh, so more on passive transport is osmosis. Osmosis is basically diffusion of water. It's the movement of water. Uh, through a semi-permeable membrane in response to a solute gradient, okay? Um, do I have red blood cells? I do. So the best example of this is dealing with something like red blood cells. I can take, do I have descriptions of hypertonic, hypotonic? I do. Um, let me just say this first, and I kind of say this in your lab that we did on this, but the idea is that water chases solutes, okay? If you have an area that's got a bunch of solutes, like think about salt water, very salty, and an area that's got very little, the water will chase the solutes to try to drive it into equilibrium. That's, uh, this is one of the reasons they say not to drink salt water if you're ever like marooned on a desert island or in a, a, you know, a dinghy out in the middle of the ocean or something from a shipwreck. You can't drink the salt water because you'll die even faster. Um, because the salt, all that salt in the salt water actually drives an osmotic gradient that pulls water out of your body into the salt water and then you evacuate or throw up all of this more dilute salt water. So when you drink the salt water, it actually drains water out of your body because of osmosis. The water from an ocean is so salty that it pulls water out of your body if you were to drink it and uh, will kill you even faster than if you just don't drink anything. This is the uh, classic phrase, water, water everywhere, but not a drop to drink. Um, if you're a victim of a shipwreck, that'll become very obvious very quickly. So don't drink the water. Uh, what else do we have? So osmotic pressure. I'm gonna talk more about this a little bit later on, but the reason that plants are capable of standing up, like herbaceous plants, not woody plants, but herbaceous plants, is because of internal osmotic pressure as a result of osmosis. Uh, so they absorb massive quantities of water and make the cells swell. And when the cells swell, it makes the, uh, the shafts of the plants taut so that the plant will stand up and thus uh, be capable of attaining sunlight. All right, let's go through and talk about blood cells. So there are three concepts that deal with osmosis here that we need to discuss. These are isotonic solutions, hypotonic solutions, and hypertonic solutions. Now, an isotonic solution is one in which the amount of solute in the cell is the same, basically, as the amount of solute outside the cell. So here we have a red blood cell in an isotonic environment. 
that would be that there's the same amount of solutes inside of the membrane as there are in the environment outside the membrane, isotonic. In this case, the red blood cell has a uh, net equal movement of water in and out, and the cell maintains its appropriate shape and size. It gets this biconcave little pink donut appearance. This is what your red blood cells are supposed to look like. By comparison to this, there are hypotonic solutions. If you drop a red blood cell into an environment which is hypotonic to that cell, the cell will swell up and get quite large indeed because the cell in a hypotonic environment would contain more solutes than the surrounding environment would. So if the cell contains more solutes, osmosis dictates that water will rush into the cell and when water rushes into the cell, the cell swells up it can actually burst. It can go through what we call a lysis. Uh, the cell will rupture and be destroyed. Or alternatively, in plant cells, they develop what's called turgor pressure. All right, turgor pressure. And uh, that's what causes pressure inside the cell to make those plants stand up and not be wilted, as we have discussed previously. Um, protozoans, yeah, I guess we can talk about it. Protozoans utilize this as well. So they have what's called a contractile vacuole. Uh, so protists, when they begin to take on excess water as a result of being in a hypotonic environment, they will uh, put water into a special vacuole in their body, and then it'll contract and shoot that water out to change their osmotic balance. So you have to do this so the cells don't swell and rupture. Pretty neat stuff, really. Okay, what else do we have here? Um, hypertonic. Okay, so if you place a red blood cell into a hypertonic solution, Hypertonic means that there is more solutes outside the cell than on the inside. So water from the inside of the cell leaks out and leaves and tries to go to the external environment. And what you end up with here is just a bunch of microtubules trying to hold the cell open and the cell appears what we call crenated. Okay, it's crenation. It will be crenated. It will be shrunk up and almost collapsed upon itself. Uh, in plants, this can lead to what we call plasmolysis. Okay, plasmolysis. Plasmolysis is basically where the uh, cell membrane inside of the plant cell shrivels up and tears itself away from the cell walls on the outside of the plant cell. Uh, and that's why if you like salt the road or you may have heard of somebody like salting somebody's yard or if you're a fan of history, um, after, hmm, don't quote me on this, but I think it was Scipio Africanus defeated uh, Hannibal? Hannibal? Uh, of Carthage? Hannibal of Carthage? I believe after Scipio defeated, defeated Hannibal of Carthage back in the Roman days, uh, Scipio then went to Carthage and salted the earth. So, so as a punishment, like no one could grow crops in Carthage after that took place. Uh, the reason for this is the salt uh, changes the osmotic balance of the soil so that plants can't suck water into their roots. There's so much salt, so much solute in the soil that the plants are physically incapable of pulling water into their roots so all the plants die. All right? Yeah, that'll work. Let's go here. Um, this is showing you lysis and turgor pressure and plasmolysis and crenation. Yeah. Go here. Uh, facilitated transport. So quite simplistically, facilitated transport is where there are helper proteins that allow larger molecules to get through the membrane, but they're not going to require energy. It's just like, um, like there's a door over there, and if that door is open, I can walk in, and I can walk out, and it doesn't take any energy on the part of the door to let me through. It's just a door so I can pass it to get in and out of this room. In the same way, there are certain uh, transport proteins that can allow things like glucose molecules, as an example, to enter or exit the cell without the use of energy. All right, they exist. And that takes us to active transport. All right, so primary active transport is energy requiring. We tend to use this to transport larger molecules or to transport uh, molecules into high concentration. So for instance, your cells uh, concentrate, geez, I don't know, uh, calcium. Let's talk about your muscle cells. So your muscle cells have to concentrate calcium internally, huge quantities. 
of calcium have to be concentrated internally. And uh, to do this, they use active transport to pump those calcium ions into concentration and store them inside the cells. They have to do this. They have to store it against concentration. This is not diffusion movement from high concentration to low concentration. With active transport, we tend to take things in low concentration and pump them into even higher concentration, okay? So active transport is energy requiring. It takes ATP. Your sodium potassium pumps and every cell in your body do this all the freaking time. Having to pump um, sodium out and potassium into the cells, I think. I think that's right. It's one or the other. <laughs> but regardless, uh, these, these pumping mechanisms are constantly working using ATP to move ions and other substances into concentration. And then, of course, there's vesicular transport. Now, vesicular transport is when you take a vessel, a vesicle, a vesicle, bind it to a cell membrane, crack that cell membrane open, and then move everything in the vesicle to the opposing side of the membrane. This can be broken down into two parts, endocytosis and exocytosis. Endocytosis is the cell bringing a vesicle and taking it into the cell. Exocytosis would be the opposite of that taking something in the cell and releasing it out. Okay, so endocytosis, the cell takes something in. Exocytosis, the cell lets something out. And the concept of vesicular transport is that you're either moving really big molecules, way bigger than you could ever move any other way, or alternatively, you're moving large amounts of very small molecules, way more than you could move in a timely manner in other ways. So vesicle binding the membrane, letting something through, that is vesicular transport. And uh, there's a few more ways that we can look at this. Uh, for endocytosis, there are three types, phago, keno, and receptor-mediated endocytosis. Phagocytosis is eating, taking in a single large uh, molecule into the cell. Kenocytosis is drinking, cell drinking, taking a bunch of fluid molecules in. And then there's receptor-mediated endocytosis. Receptor-mediated endocytosis simply means that you have receptors there that pick up the presence of incredibly specific molecules and absorb them into the cell quite like vigorously, actively. Uh, this is seen, for example, in, your, in the placenta. So a developing embryo requires very specific molecules. It doesn't need a lot of one thing. It needs very specific molecules. So what you'll have in the placenta is these receptor uh, locations, and when those specific molecules bind to the receptors, they form a vesicle and absorb that substance into uh, the placental area for our purposes, in essence, sending it to the fetus for developmental purposes. Yeah, that'll do. That'll work. All right, so that's how this works, man. That's how this goes. Uh, here is a sweet macrophage. Uh, it, what it has is these feelers, it's grabbing hold of bacterial molecules, and it's dragging them towards itself uh, to consume them via phagocytosis. Not unlike the Sarlacc pit in Star Wars, for those of you that keep up with your pop culture references. Let's go here. Uh, as I've said before, I like to include charts and things just to help you when you're studying. I'm not going to go over it, but it's there. Let's talk a little bit about modifications to animal cells that can... Um, lead to variations in function. Animal cells on the outer surface of their cells have an extracellular matrix. This is part of what's commonly referred to as connective tissue. And in this, there will be all sorts of things, man. Just all sorts of things. Uh, for example, there will be collagen and elastin fibers, sometimes more collagen, sometimes more elastin, sometimes mixed. Collagen fiber is very strong, it's taut, it's what gives your skin its strength to some degree, is all the collagen in it. Um, elastin fibers are stretchy. One of the reasons your ear is kind of flexible is because it contains a lot of elastin fibers. In fact, you can really feel this, like your nose is mostly collagen, so your nose is very hard and strong, whereas your ear is very flexible because your ear has a lot of elastin, all right? Uh, and what else do I want to say here? I guess I can mention proteic lichens. So proteic lichens are these crazy sugar molecules in essence. Uh, it's like a single backbone with all these projections, just like a fir tree, man, just sticking out all over the place. And the idea is you get a whole bunch of these together and they just stick to each other like freaking Christmas tree lights in a box. And it's very hard to separate them out 
and they can actually guide the movements of cells. Uh, they can regulate the expression of certain molecules. Yeah, I mean, it's kind of neat. Uh, they can actually restrain certain bacteria from being able to get through your tissues. Um, yeah, it, it's just kind of cool. It's part of your extracellular matrix. So on the outside of your cell, it's like a big gummy mess that it's hard to get through in some cases. Yeah. Yeah, I'm down with that. Oh, kind of cool, bone versus blood. Uh, bone and blood both include this type of system. Uh, in bone, the extracellular matrix includes a bunch of calcium and phosphate crystals that make the bone very hard. Okay, bone is very hard. Whereas in blood, the extracellular matrix is uh, mostly made of what we call plasma, which is almost entirely water. So this extracellular matrix is kind of cool in that it's quite flexible. It can be one thing or another or any derivation there. Yeah, good enough. Good enough. Um, yeah, so this is just showing you some sweet aerial or connective tissue. You can see the cells and all these fibers. This is actually a three-dimensional structure. So the outsides of your cells are just covered in these fibrous networks um, that allow for the movement of certain, par uh, certain particles but not others. And I feel like we've already done this, but I'll do it again. Uh, your surface modifications continue. So there can be tight junctions, desmosomes, and gap junctions. So tight junctions are those where we have uh, basically two cell membranes that are connected with rivets, and they sort of really stick together in a tight junction so that nothing can get between cells. And if nothing gets between cells, that means that any molecules that need to get from one place to the next have to travel through the cells, and the cells are selectively permeable. So this is the way that we set up a barrier to only absorb things that we want and to keep everything else out. You have to connect the cells together in a very tight manner so that anything that gets in has to go through the cell in its selective process, which is kind of cool. It's how your intestines absorb nutrients and not bacteria. For those of you that are not aware, uh, your intestines are just packed with bacteria. So how do you keep from absorbing those bacteria into your bloodstream? Tight junctions. And uh, there are also desmosomes. Desmosomes attach to intermediate filaments and in essence um, form a, a linking system that links cells to one another so that they can uh, all sort of experience tension simultaneously. This basically makes a whole tissue strong as a unit because they're all linked together via these very tough desmosomes and their intermediate filaments that act like ropes. Uh, this is like putting rebar in concrete. And then, of course, there are gap junctions. Gap junctions have an opening within them, and what this does is it links cells together cytoplasmically. So if all these cells have gap junctions, that means if one cell, um, geez, I don't know, if it, if it uh, is signaled to have a chemical change internally, that chemical change will then be transmitted to all the adjacent cells which bear desmosomes. Your heart, no, 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 which bear gap junctions. Your heart's the classic example of this. Um, if we zap one spot in your heart, the whole heart will contract because every cell in the heart is linked to every other cell in the heart by gap junctions. So it's a uh, form of chemical linkage that can take place within cells. And plants do this too, but in plants these are called, where is it, plasma desmata. If you look, these plant cells are connected to little, little lines. There are little lines between these. Uh, these are referred to as plasma desmata, and they will allow uh, the free passage of certain chemicals, think about like water and nutrient molecules as examples, uh, to move from one cell to the next. Uh, this contributes to the swelling of the central vacuoles and uh, the development of turgor pressure that allows a plant to stand up when it's wilted. And last but not least, Cellulose, all right? Uh, cellulose is a bound form of glucose that is structural, okay? It is a structural um, sugar complex, and it forms the cell walls of plants, okay? Cellulose. Cellulose forms the cell walls of plants. It is structural. We are not capable of digesting it. This is what we call plant fiber. And uh, that's it, folks. That's all we got. So I hope you enjoyed this lecture. I enjoyed giving it. It's a pretty cool one. And um, go get your lab stuff done. All right. Have a good day.